Every day you and I get bombarded with negative news. Just like the body becomes what we eat, the mind becomes what we're putting in. It is important to listen to stories that not only gives you hope, but also inspires you and uplifts you. In this podcast, we're interviewing experts who will break down the solutions to the world's most pressing problems. And I promise you, if you listen to this podcast, you will not only stay informed, but you will also feel more energy in your life. Welcome to Great.com Talks with... Great.com is a philanthropical project where we're trying to donate 100% of our profit towards the most effective cause areas like protecting the rainforest, uh, funding climate change technology. And the topic of today is in a society with so much information, how who can I actually trust to get reliable information? So we're going to talk about information and science today. Um, and to understand more about this, we have invited American Council on Science and Health and the American Council of Science and Health is a nonprofit organization um, who advocates for reliable information. And our guest here is the medical director of this organization, Chuck Dinerstein. Chuck, Close welcome enough. to this interview. Did I pronounce you correctly? Close enough for government work. No Dinerstein. Problem. I guess uh, the tricky part here is to tell what is the truth here. I guess that is what science is at least trying to <laughs> help yes. me to, to understand better so help me uh see what different um forces are there out there who are trying to influence what is the truth on the uh on the spectra what are we talking about for which forces well, there, yeah. well there, there is no truth to science it, it, i like to think about science in two ways science is a verb as in the scientific method, as in being curious, as in exploring things. And I don't think that any of us would have a problem with that. I think that science has gone a long way towards uh, improving our lives. But science, the noun, is where there's a lot of yelling and screaming. Science in terms of the facts uh, make a difference because the, the science is predicated on the idea that uh, the facts may change over time. I mean, you can take a classic example. It used to be that the sun revolved around the earth. That was a fact up until Galileo and Copernicus came along and said, well, maybe it's not such a, a fact anymore and, and, and proved that that situation was different. The same holds true for a lot of the um, beliefs we have today. Um, let's talk for a second about air pollution. And let me be real clear. We all want clean air. There's not a question about that. But our science has been able to measure um, the pollutants in our outside environment. We can do that well. And all of the regulations pertaining to air pollution have to do with things we can measure. Uh, soot, PM 2.5, PM 10, these numbers, these kind of things um, are the things we can measure. They're the things we can regulate. Over time, we've seen two things. One is that we discovered that our definitions were lacking. We be our definitions become more and more refined over time. So things that we've regulated in the past, not necessarily with a problem. More importantly, we spend nearly 90% of our times indoors now. And the outdoor air has a much lower effect on our lives than it may have in the past because we live in uh, buildings that are air conditioned with windows that can't be opened with heating systems. And so a lot of the indoor pollution, the things that we might associate with um, making us ill come from things that we, we bring in the house, cooking, uh, all the fragrances and all the uh, cleaning products we use, those are things that we bring in that we could easily say we don't want to have that would change the, the level of quote unquote pollutants in the air. When you, when you look across the, the world globally, the, the biggest source of indoor air pollution is the use of wood for cooking because India and China have such a large population that just skews the numbers. 
in, in terms of the facts. So science facts, <laughs> the science, the noun is where a lot of the controversy takes place. And I, I think you see it today with all, all the back and forth with COVID-19. Mm. <clears throat> so you're saying that um, let help me clarify what would you say would be the the message that you you're what is I the think core that, message here I think that our message is that the facts that we have about science are all subject to change over time there are best belief at the moment and we should take them as a best belief but we don't they're not immutable laws passed down from the creator or from from the god of science they're all subject to constant review and concern and right. that and that so given that framework it's very tough to to deal with people that are very dogmatic about it has to be this way, this is what it is. Because that's not in, in heart and soul, the nature of what science is really about. Science is a way of explaining. It's not, it's not a, a dog. And when it works, it, it works very well. And so American Council on Science and Health would offer um, another voice in, in all of the different voices that I'm hearing as an individual. Uh, American Council uh, is helping with that. Uh, to we be... offer a voice, and I think one of the big differences for us is that the our writing staff are all um, scientists. If I include myself as a physician in science, I'm an applied scientist. Um, we're scientists. We're not attorneys. We're not looking for a regulatory agenda to push. We're just trying to report what we're seeing um, in the sciences that, that we look at. I have a, a longstanding interest in uh, health. I have a big interest in uh, the areas of frailty and um, how diseases impact our lives and how these diseases come and go. And so I, I, I find the articles and what I think are the cutting edge of science and I bring them to our readership. I explain new, new concepts in science that weren't there, weren't there for me in medical school, let alone for, for somebody that just had a, you know, a biology class in, in college. So we explain those kind of things and we share with them um, articles in the, in the mainstream scientific health literature and share with them what other scientists are, are writing about and finding. And it, the, none of it is all, none of it's conclusive but it, it does kind of fill in the gaps of uh, what's missing. Again, let me give you another example. This last week, um, Pew Research came out with a study on American um, opinions about COVID-19 and vaccines. And they showed in the headline that was picked up by the mainstream media is that 60% of Americans are now willing to consider taking uh, a COVID-19 vaccine which is up from 40% from a few months ago. That was the big headline. But if you spend a few minutes actually reading their entire report, which very few people are gonna do, there was a lot of other very interesting things in it. And in fact, probably the, the most interesting thing from my point of view was that the, the black American community is the most vaccine hesitant of all the groups that they looked at. And they're the group that's probably at greatest risk. And that's going to become a problem in the next few months as we try to roll out um, vaccination. How are we going to reach into that community that has very legitimate reason for being hesitant about some offering from the medical community and get them appropriately vaccinated? That's the kind of difference that you get when you, when you look at our writing. We get a little bit farther behind the headlines and share with you some of the, the science and the understanding behind it that you won't get from looking uh, necessarily on the internet and, and Dr. Google. Dr. Google, yeah. Um, that, that really helps that example. 
um, to understand what, what what it is that you're doing. And you're saying that you have a lot of rec- uh, you have a lot of those scientists who are doing this as a full time work to just. Um... We have well, I wish it was a lot of people. We have three full time uh, writers that are producing direct content on a daily basis. We have a two to three hundred uh, member board of scientific advisors who also contribute articles. So there's probably ten or twelve writers um, that are providing. Uh, this kind of content over the course of a week. We probably, I would think we probably have 500 original pieces over the course of the year, uh, looking at various aspects of science or again, uh, regulatory policy, nutrition. We try to cover a a large range uh, of topics that we think are important to the general public. Uh, give me um, as a uh, g- give me some examples of what would be controversial standpoints where um, like people might disagree with what you have actually found from science. Okay, I think, that the, I think that there is no evidence that organic growing is more nutritious. Okay, I pick my word carefully, more nutritious. Will some people feel that it's safer? Yes. Am I gonna fight with them about it? No, that's their choice. I understand that. I don't think that there's a great deal of evidence to show that it's far safer, but uh, I recognize that that's a difference of opinion and it's their comfort level and that's fine. But it, it, there's no science to show that it's, it's a more nutritious uh, version of a tomato than one that's grown in, in a different setting. Maybe more tasty, but not necessarily more nutritious. And then you have to ask, do you want to pay the premium to have an identical food? That, that would be one of the things that, that we would we could wrangle about, um, but that I think that science stands and says, here's what it shows. Um, again, the, the, this, whole, um, this whole area of GMOs, and, and this is the, the, the statistic that I'd like to say, the same, the same group of people that feel that science backs up the claim that the climate is changing, which it does, it's the same group that says, science says the GMOs are bad. But when you look at the organizations that, uh, of, of scientists talking about it, 98% of scientists feel that climate change is related to our behavior. 99% of scientists believe GMOs are okay. So they're picking and choosing what science they want to believe. They're picking and choosing their science of nouns, not science of verb. And so I, I, I can understand the argument about why certain GMOs would bother them, especially the ones that were created um, when you use um, bacterial and animal vectors to, to get the, the DNA into the, into the crop. I can understand why they would have some concerns about that, but I don't think that those concerns have been borne out. I think that the newer techniques using CRISPR um, are going to get around those points. And then it's worth looking at whether um, GMOs have a, a legitimate place in, in, our, in our society today. And especially, you know, if, if you believe all the science that seems to be coming out about how warming weather will change the content of our produce, then GMOs may be a way to mitigate some of those changes. And I, again, you don't have to fully agree with me, but I'd like you at least to, to, to hear the argument, to understand the science about it so that we can have a conversation so that we don't talk to one another in slogans. That I think is, that's, that's the important part of the, having that relationship. That's back to that doctor patient thing. Now I'm not, past, I'm not talking past you, you're not talking past me. 
We're talking about what's important to both of us. We're looking for the commonality and seeing whether we can go from there. Does, I don't know if that works better in terms of explaining it. Well, to summarize, um, the functions of society is based on policymakers' decisions, and policymakers' decisions are based on the information they have. So you help to provide a bigger picture of the information, um, yes. I guess. That could be. A bit, we try to get that information to the policymakers. More importantly, we try to get that information to the public so that they understand um, how and why these policies are, are being developed, because all policies are trade offs. And we try to be a little bit less agenda driven in, in terms of what we think uh, the policy should be. Um, thanks for clarifying. Yeah. So if we go for, <clears throat> what would you like for people to, um, when they hear this interview, what would you like people to do uh, after hearing this interview? Okay, I mean, we have two very simple asks. First one is come over to the website and read some of the things that we're writing about. Come sample what we're talking about. We're at www.csh.org um, and read it. If you like what we have to say, if you find it irritating, but at least thought provoking, then the second ask is, is gonna always be help us out in terms of donation. Like all the other nonprofits uh, this year, COVID-19 has been a real hit to everybody's revenue stream. Uh, we are a small organization. Um, and so, and the preponderance of our um, finances come from small donors. So you like what we have to say, consider donation. I probably write um, 20 single space pages a month. So I figure I'm worth a cup of Starbucks coffee. Or whatever that costs, uh, in terms of that. so those those are the real asks. But I, I think that people would find um, what we write engaging, at times amusing, and always educational. How can I tell if I read something um, uh, if it's reliable or not? What, ah, do, you have, do you have advice? That, that's an interesting. It's an interesting, interesting um, problem that's been with us for a long time and its scale has made that difficult. You know, it used to be when you, you lived in a small village, everybody knew the village idiot and you yeah. could ignore them. <laughs> He's a nice guy or a nice person, but you could ignore him. But in today's world, uh, that becomes a, a much more difficult thing to do. Um, I take my approach from uh, one of my favorite uh, webcasts, 99% Invisible, that talks about design. And it says, always read the plaque. If you're looking at a building, always read the plaque that's, that's affixed to the building, meaning go to your primary sources. And that's our approach. It, every one of my article is sourced to uh, a, an article in the literature. You don't have to take my word for it. You can go and, and look that up. Um, and I think that that's what um, makes for a trustworthy institution. Um, but, it, you, you know, you've gotten to a real key dilemma in terms of things. And the other way to inoculate yourself against that is to read or to look more widely. It's important to look at the contrary view and see whether there's something in there that, that's worthwhile, that has a, a kernel of truth to it. You know, there, I rarely fun, come across a uh, work where there wasn't something in there that was interesting or new or different. You know, curiosity may be the, um, the antidote for lack of trust. Curiosity would be the antidote for lack of trust. Hmm. 